Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, this evening uh, for another Canada Soccer Club Licensing Program presentation with Dave Nutt, who is the Manager of Operations for Development in Canada Soccer in the Development Department. Um, today's topic is balancing quality with accessibility and inclusion. So this is part two of the conversation that we started a couple weeks ago, and I'll turn it over to you, Dave. Thanks, Raheem. Appreciate it. And thanks again, everyone, for having me and for making the time on a Thursday night. So uh, although this is part two of a discussion, you certainly uh, can join at this point and won't be uh, far behind. I'll revisit a few of the concepts that we talked about last time uh, in preparation for what we'll do today, which for those that were engaged last time around, I hope that it's going to be a lot more interactive this time. And uh, as with most of these types of learning opportunities, uh, myself included, we're going to get it. We're going to get out of it what we put in. So I'm, I'm excited to work with you through this one. And uh, uh, for those that were on a little bit early, I was just uh, chatting with Raheem. I've got a fair amount of content, um, but I know there's also great content within each one of you. And if we can get good conversation and good discussion, I think that's the best that uh, we can do for this workshop. And it may mean that uh, some of the slides and some of the presentation contact we may not get to, but I will share the slides afterwards. And certainly if, uh, if there's a desire, we can regroup and uh, take on a little bit more of this if we don't get through everything. So uh, to start us off, I'm just gonna turn my camera off now that I've done the introduction because I found on a few of these that uh, my, uh, my uh, capacity from the internet uh, is not always great and sometimes can uh, uh, start to, to be a bit of an issue while I'm speaking and the things that I'm talking about in the slides are a lot more important than how I look. So I wanted to uh, drop in and say hello to everybody. I'll turn my video off to make sure that we can, uh, can get good sound, which is the most important things. So just give me a second to do that and we'll get right into it. So. Today, what we're hoping to get out of this is, oops, there we go, let's get that going here, uh, desired outcome. So the first thing that we're going to try to do is define quality sport. From there, we also want to develop some considerations in fostering accessible and inclusive environments. And those are the two things that we're going to talk about as two of the principles. And most important to this conversation is going to be around the discussion of balancing quality with accessibility and inclusion. I'll talk a little bit about that up front, but a lot of times we think that this needs to be one or the other. If we have a high quality program, then it needs to be less accessible and inclusive. Or if we have a program that's as accessible and inclusive as it can possibly be, then the quality suffers. So hopefully through today's workshop, we're gonna come up with some strategies uh, to be able to, to uh, deal with that within our own environments and can create uh, a program that can be both high quality and accessible and inclusive. And for me, the most important part, and hopefully uh, will be something that we'll get to uh, in, in really good detail, is the idea of developing actions where we can balance quality and accessibility and inclusion within your member organization. So your club or your academy. So hopefully with the number of people we have on the call and the conversation we're gonna have, we're gonna walk away with a good handful of strategies that we might be able to explore within our club to make sure that our environments are both high quality and accessible and inclusive and then the final piece if there is enough time that's why it's in brackets there is the idea of considering accessibility as we would risk so uh, some ideas around awareness tolerance and mitigation so uh, I'm assuming because we're, I've got uh, good numbers and I'm hoping for some healthy discussion that we're probably not going to get to that but you'll get some information on it and certainly if uh, there's an interest in exploring that further I'm more than happy to do that so start us off with just a quick revisit for those that weren't a part of things last time where we explored principles in great detail. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the concept of principles. So we went into the details about what principles are and why they're important the last time around. Uh, but just as a quick catch up those that weren't a part of things the last time, the important takeaways are principles are general guidance for our behaviors, but they're not prescriptive. 
So they don't tell us specifically what we need to do. And by taking a principle-based approach, it allows us the flexibility to be able to select our own methods that will apply best to our context. So we know within this room, every club, uh, even those that might be in the same city, have got different realities. We know those in different communities have different contexts that they need to work in. They've got different resources available to them from coaches to fields. They've got different uh, cultural backgrounds that form a part of their communities. They've got different community engagement strategies. So by taking a, a principles-based approach, it allows us to really recognize the regional differences and realities and allow people to move forward within the constraints that are provided by those broad principles. So what are the principles that we're talking about? Uh, we spent a fair amount of detail on this the last time around, so I'm just gonna go really quickly for anyone that's interested in exploring this in a bit more detail that missed the last session. Uh, I believe it's recorded and available, so uh, I'm not gonna spend any time defining what these look like, but our seven principles that guide club licensing, the first one, prioritize fun. Second one, emphasize physical, mental, and emotional safety. The third one, provide developmentally appropriate high quality programs. The fourth, maximize attraction, holistic personal development, progression and long-term engagement. Fifth, focus on participant-centered decision-making. The sixth one, foster accessible, inclusive and welcoming environments. And the last one, and certainly not least, act as a good corporate and community citizen. So those are the seven principles that kind of underlie everything that we're trying to do from a club licensing perspective and really creating this behavioral change where we wanna focus on these seven principles that underlie everything that we stand for as a soccer community and support the participants within. So for today, we're going to focus mostly on providing developmentally appropriate high quality programs and fostering accessible and inclusive and welcoming environments. And really the particularity of what we're going to do today is about how we balance these two principles. And a lot of times uh, they may seem as though they're at odds with each other. So it's often a, a tricky thing to try to be able to do to balance those two principles and do it well so that we have programs that are both high quality and accessible and inclusive. And hopefully through today's conversation and some of the ideas from some of the smart people we have on the, uh, on the call tonight, we'll be able to come up with some really good strategies to be able to do that. So to start with, in order to be able to create that balance, the first thing we need to do is have a good understanding around what quality programming is. So if we can, Raheem, we'll open up the microphones and I think we'll try to do this first one as a group and see if we can, uh, can have some good discussion around what a quality program is. So in your own mind, what makes a program high quality? David, anyone can yeah. open their mic. Perfect, okay. thanks Kevin. Perfect. Structure and organization. Structure and organization. Yeah, absolutely. Of the of the program itself, you mean? Absolutely. So what types of things would you put into there, Kevin? What would you consider to be a quality structure and organization as compared to something that uh, that may not be as high quality? Well, if you look at scheduling in advance, uh, proper communication, those kind of things. Nice, absolutely. Yeah, communication is key for your stakeholders and uh, some of the areas of understanding for as parents, we all have busy lives, our kids have busy lives. So the more advanced notice we have about what to expect from a program when it's going to happen uh, is an important piece. Absolutely. Structure and organization and, uh, and a, a specific drill down there around communication. Anyone else? What, uh, what makes a quality program? Um, certified educated coaches. Um, that have the correct skill sets for the various ages that we're going to be offered within that program. Absolutely. So the people, the people that power your programs are important and primarily they're your coaches. So uh, within a lot of the presentations we do, we, uh, we kind of uh, draw the parallel between soccer clubs and restaurants. So if you work in a restaurant, the most important person is your chef. So the person who decides what the menu is going to look like and works with the cooks to be able to prepare uh, the food. So that's your technical lead within your organization. The next most important people are your chefs and those are your coaches in a club. So those are the people that are the face of the organization. They're the ones that have the most interaction with your, uh, with your stakeholders or with your customers who are your players and your parents. So if you have high quality coaches, 
the chances of you providing a quality environment, particularly if you structure it well, it's well organized, and as an organization you communicate well, that's going to improve. Uh, it's going to improve the chances of being considered a quality program. And some key pieces there, Hugh, that, uh, that you mentioned is, the first one was around training and certification. So the coaches have the right training for the program that they provide. And the second piece was they're the right people because that's a key piece to it as well, as, as all of you that have been involved in the game, and I know a number of you have for a number of years, uh, there's certain skill sets, there's certain uh, types of people who function better in different environments. So it's not necessarily the same skill set to coach an under six player as it would to be an under 16 player in say the PSL level or the division two level. Uh, it's not always the same skill set coaching young girls and young boys. So the skill set of the player beyond, or the skill set of the coach beyond just the, uh, uh, the training is an important piece as well. So we've got so far structure, organization, communication, and people, particularly the coaches. What else makes a high quality program? Well, Dave, even in your in the number that you have listed here, where you say provide developmentally appropriate program, wouldn't developmentally appropriate programming be something that would be under quality programming? Absolutely. So, what's uh, what's developmentally appropriate? What are the types well, of things you should think about there? Obviously, you're looking at age groups. You're looking at levels of uh, players, and make sure your your program is structured based on on that criteria that offers the uh, the different scenarios for for player development. Yeah, so we're not uh, we're not putting players in positions where they're not ready. And I know uh, Kevin, you and I have talked about this uh, many times. The good old days when we started playing eleven aside soccer at under seven, we are I hope anyway a little more knowledgeable than that now because uh, uh, I've got children, as some of you know, uh, about that age and have coached in those age groups. And you know, sometimes the three v threes and the four v fours and five v fives at that age are painful. I can't imagine what uh, what parents would have thought of games that were played. 11 v 11 on a full-size field at those ages knowing that uh, that the ability to use that space is limited so yeah developmentally appropriate we're creating programs and within those programs the training sessions and the games are appropriate for the players that participate that's a, a great point mm -hmm. what about program transparency Dave program transparency for all the stakeholders to see what we can offer have policies and procedures within that program so parents can see exactly what their children are going to be going to be getting sure yeah an important piece along with communication so that uh, that idea of we're going to tell you what you can expect of us and then we're going to deliver so one of the biggest challenges we have, and, and it's not a soccer issue, it's kind of globally in, in all elements of customer service, is when there's an expectation that isn't met with the reality. Whether you're a retailer or a restaurant, if you're promising um, you know, a, a steak and lobster dinner and you're delivering a Big Mac, there's probably yeah. going to be concerns there. So similarly, if you're expecting a program that's going to train three days a week and have games on the weekend, and we deliver a program that only has one training session, that's going to be an issue. So letting people know what to expect from our programs and then delivering, that's, uh, that's an important piece as well, absolutely. Anything else from anyone? Any other ideas on what might make a quality program? Think about the experience of the player. From a player's perspective, what makes a quality program? Yeah, would it be fun, enjoyable, interact? You want the atmosphere to be appealing to especially the young kids? Yeah, think back to our principles, it's fun. Our, there's a, uh, a, a gentleman we work with uh, by the name of Matt Young who's uh, uh, involved with a group called the Quality Sport Hub. And it's really about uh, kind of boiling down some of those fundamental pieces of what players want uh, and, and what coaches and what clubs want from their sport experience. And he's got a great saying and it's catchy so it's easy to remember. And he says, players want fun, friends, friendly competition, and they want to finish better than they started. So he boils his down to, to four uh, key components to that, with fun being the first one, and then the, the friend components of the social element, which is an important piece as well, particularly for young players. A lot of them do it because they want to be around their friends, they want to be around their peers. And then that idea of friendly competition, which comes along with program structure and program organization. And in order to have friendly competition, uh, 
in order to have friendly competition, it also needs to be meaningful. And what that means is we enter into competition without the result being predetermined. And I know a lot of you, I've coached a lot of, uh, against a lot of you, with a lot of you, and uh, I spent a lot of time talking about this kind of thing. And we know uh, in Saskatchewan, there's, there's challenges sometimes with finding that meaningful competition where, you know, over the course of a season, you may only get a handful of games that are really competitive and you're not sure how that result is going to go on the day. And you'll play in a lot of others where you go into that game knowing, you know, we're a stronger team and we're probably going to be successful today. Or alternatively, you know, we're not as strong a team and it's going to be a real challenge. And how am I going to manage this as a coach? And that's a unique skill set to be able to have as a coach. But if we can create meaningful competition, that's where the most learning happens as players. So if we have an environment where there's a chance that we could be successful if we play well, but if we don't, then we won't be as successful. That's really one of the drivers of improvement within the game environment. Any other ideas? Think again from a, from a player perspective. What are, the, what are the things that a player would look for in that experience? maybe to frame it a little bit differently. What, what would a player, for those of you that have kids, when you ask your kids, you know, how was soccer today? What are the types of things that they talk about? Because that'd be a good indicator of what they see as quality. What makes it a good training session or a game versus a training session or a game that was meh? Mm. I've lost you. We can still hear you, Hugh. Can you hear us? Oh. Yep, I got it. You got it. Yeah, you came in and out. I guess there's many things like when you talk about a player, you know, when they come home from a session, obviously they're going to say, how engaged was the coach with, with the players? Um, how organized was the coach in the session? And, uh, and, and, and they'll ask, good coaches will ask for feedback from the players, the 360 feedback. How did I do? How did you feel the session went? So inclusion with the coach in the session, I think is massive, making the player feel that they, they're inclusive in, in, in what the outcome of the sessions would be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's going back to our people again. So our people sure. are engaged. They're, uh, the players feel as though they're included. Uh -huh. They feel as though they have an opportunity to contribute to the training session, so they're not just told what to do. And I think a lot of those things, they really go towards that idea of a holistic or a four corners approach where, you know, generally speaking, when we look at, at soccer programming, we do a pretty good job of making sure we deal with the technical tactical elements. So we teach soccer. We usually understand and, and appreciate that the physical components are really important because it's a physical game. You know, it takes a lot of endurance to play a 90 minute match at a high level. It takes strength, it takes stamina, it takes speed. It takes all of these uh, important physical components to be successful. But are we also creating environments that provide mental and social emotional support? So are we creating an environment that's free of bullying and harassment? Are we creating an environment where our players are challenged mentally and supported? where they're not criticized for their mistakes. Mistakes are seen as a learning opportunity. Uh, so that idea of providing that holistic approach uh, <laughs> supports. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Maybe from, uh, from someone who hasn't, uh, hasn't piped in yet? No, everyone's shy? Oh. And right, right at the buzzer there. So that, uh, that works. So I think we've got a good start here in defining what a quality program looks like. So we've talked about things like uh, coaches or the people involved. We've talked about structure and organization. Uh, and from that perspective, things like it being developmentally appropriate, it being fun, it being engaging, uh, there being some improvement. Uh, idea around transparency and communication being important. So uh, all really good things and all really important. So uh, just to give us a little bit more around that, I've, uh, I've done some research and had a look at some of the other ideas that are out there and some of the, uh, the information that's available. And I think that supplements a lot of the things that we've talked about uh, already. And I think it also reinforces that there's a relatively good understanding uh, from the people that were presenting ideas anyway, in terms of what quality sport looks like. So, first area we looked to is, uh, come on now, uh, through, 
an organization called Sports Life. And for those that have been around the game for a little while, this is the group behind long-term athlete development, which is long-term development now is the, uh, the new acronym because we're realizing it's not just to athletes. And this comes from a resource called Quality Sport for Communities and Clubs, which is really a guide around how you create quality programs. And what they look at is quality sport being built around four guiding principles. And the first one is quality is key. And what they boil it down to, and it's great because I think a lot of the things that, uh, that came out in that last conversation are very much aligned to this area as well, is the idea that quality includes good programs, good places delivered by good people. And I'm going to go into that in a little bit more detail in a minute, but that's their first principle is quality is key. Second one, optimal programming is critical. So if we go back to our club licensing principles while you're reading that, so there's a couple of really strong areas of alignment here. So the idea of being participant centered, so putting the player at the heart of everything that we do and being developmentally appropriate, like Kevin presented during that last conversation. Both of those things are very important if we're going to have quality, uh, quality sport. So if it's not developmentally appropriate and it's not the right thing for the player in terms of giving them what they need, when they need it, and in the way that they need it, then it's not going to be a quality sporting experience. The next one, inclusion is non-negotiable. Great, my job is done. We already see that inclusion is a part of quality sport. These things aren't mutually exclusive or not in opposition to each other. So that idea of removing barriers is important, but also designing activities or designing programs so that people feel included, they feel welcome, they feel safe is an important piece as well. So it's beyond just removal of barriers, which is kind of the accessibility side of things. So do we have the opportunity for young people in particular, uh, but it could be adults as well, if there's any, uh, any folks running adult programming on the call, uh, to be able to access sport. But then the inclusion piece, which is kind of ongoing and active, is what are we doing to make them feel safe, welcome, and included on an ongoing basis? So both the idea of accessibility and the idea of inclusion. And in the Sport for Life model, that's built right into the foundation of quality sport, which is great, because that's aligned to a lot of the things that we want to talk about is how can we have both? How can we consider inclusion as a part of our high quality sport experience? And the last one, collaboration makes the system better. And this again links back to our principles around working together to be a good corporate and community citizen. So there's a lot of different stakeholders that are involved in an athlete. So from systems theory that I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, we've got all of these individual actors in a complex system that is soccer, and they all have an impact on the individual's experience. So we can never work with an individual or create a program in isolation because we know, particularly in Saskatchewan, where they have lots of multi-sport athletes, people are going to do a number of different things. So how does our program fit within the broader scope of what the individual is doing from school to other sports to recreational activities to musical activities to family commitments? So how do we balance all of that? And if we can work together and create alignment at all levels through the system, so that includes alignment from club to region or district to province to Canada soccer that we'll talk a bit more about later on, as well as alignment within the programming that we're running within our own club. So is there opportunities for different groups to train together so that we can have some of that type of alignment as well? So by working together, we create a better quality sports system. And to circle us back around to the, uh, the principles that Sport for Life came up with, so the idea of good people, good places, making good programs, they've gone a little bit deeper here. And as you have a peek through that, I think what you'll really see is that this is really well aligned to the principles that we have in club licensing. If you pull out some of the key words, almost all nine of the, or sorry, all seven of those principles are represented amongst this idea of good programs, good people, good places. So the idea of being participant centered, the idea of being developmentally appropriate, of being safe, of being fun, of being accessible, inclusive, and welcoming, of having good people with good knowledge. So that has to do with the people involved in delivering your program, your coaches, those overseeing your programs that have an understanding, the idea of meaningful competition. So all of these things that we talked about are a part of the foundation of what Sport for Life and their expertise have found through the research and developing what they would consider to be quality sport. 
So that's the multi-sport world. That's the, uh, the quality sport for communities and clubs program. And all of this is available on the website. It's not hard to find. It's all uh, available at, uh, at Sport for Life. But if anybody's having problems finding any of this information and wants to read up on it a little bit more, by all means, uh, let me know, let Raheem know, and we will connect you with those resources. But what does that mean from a soccer specific perspective? So at Canada Soccer, we've uh, created a new player pathway, and I know a lot of you have seen this before. It's on all of our coaching courses, and it's not so much a pathway in the traditional sense where we think, oh, it's this beautiful, you know, manicured uh, walkway that's going to take me from the first time I kicked the ball as a four-year-old to play for the men's or women's national team. Unfortunately, the game doesn't work that way. Uh, rather than being a manicured pathway, it's a lot of stops and starts, it's a lot of sidesteps, it's a lot of movement between. So the way we see our player pathway is really about defining the environments that exist across the country. And I know SAS Soccer have put a lot of time and energy into interpreting this pathway for the provincial use, as a lot of the other provinces across the country have. And they've started to place some standards or some expectations around the environments within this pathway that exist in this province in order to be able to ensure that there is quality. So what we would look for in an environment that sits in the competitive stream is different from what we would look for in the community stream. And both of those things are different than what a fundamentals program might look like or an active start program. And for those that have had the opportunity to either play, train, uh, coach at a higher level, and I know, uh, I think I saw that Jerson was on the call here. So the environment that he works in at the university level in that performance world, train to compete, is very different than competitive senior soccer. And that is still different from when we get into the professional world for uh, guys like Kevin Holness who have played at that level. And for those that have the opportunity to be around a senior national team, that's even different level at the international level and the expectations that come when you play in World Cup qualifiers and World Cups and Olympic Games and those types of things. So it's about putting some standards around each one of these levels that really defines what quality is and what those expectations are and recognizing that they're all going to be different. So how do we know? How do we assess our own organizations and understand, are we providing quality programs? So there's a couple of resources that I'd encourage you to have, uh, to have a look at if you have the time. So the first one is the uh, checklist that accompanies the Sport for Life resources that I talked about earlier. So it really gives you a drill down around those ideas of good people, good places, good programs. And it's a simple list that you can self-assess your program. Well, am I considering all of these things when I develop my program, if I want it to be high quality? And the other one, I know a lot of you have uh, spent some time with this already with the great work that uh, you've all done in achieving the standards for quality soccer within the province. So the Canada Soccer Standards for Quality Soccer, which is basically the, uh, the entry level into the club licensing program and really defines from a Canada soccer perspective what quality sport looks like at our level. And there's some additional resources that we're working on to support that a little bit further. There's also resources like the long-term player development model, which goes into what we would consider to be developmentally appropriate sport. Uh, there'll be some areas around grassroots standards, which really defines what it is that we're looking for for programs within that sector, including things like skill centers for those that have taken a children's license. It really is kind of the, the, the pinnacle program uh, for grassroots soccer, as well as the concepts of what that looks like as you move into older ages with standards-based leagues, standards-based programs, and those types of things. So I encourage you to explore some of those things if you want to get an idea of specifically what is my club doing or potentially not doing that may lead us not to have the quality that we expect from our programming or alternatively all the great things that we're doing that reinforce quality because it's important and if we go back to this slide I said this last week uh, on the call we all know or at least a lot of us know that uh, that have put thought into this that numbers across the country in soccer are going down and it's a soccer problem it's a sport problem and it's a global problem even in places that have mature, well-developed, really professionally run uh, soccer programs. Germany, as an example, that most people in the international soccer world would suggest have the highest quality uh, system of anywhere in the world, their numbers are dropping. So it's not only about quality programming and quality opportunities, but what we often see is that numbers 
aren't dropping the same in different spheres. So oftentimes the programs we have within our clubs, our premier programs, our academy programs, our prospects programs, all of these things with verbiage that, uh, that indicates quality, those ones have got waiting lists. They've got people lined up. They've got people coming to tryouts because they want to be identified for those environments. And our entry level, our recreational community grassroots programming, they're the ones that are struggling. Those numbers aren't what they used to be. And I'll give an example. I know uh, just from scrolling through the names, there's a number of people in, uh, in Saskatoon that are on the call, and I live here myself for those that, that don't know. Uh, so I've got a fairly, uh, I'm fairly familiar with the system here, and I think it's relevant to, to this conversation. The idea that in the past we had community association soccer, uh, in the old days all the way up to, to the under 12 level, uh, now up to the under uh, nine level. But what we would probably consider that to be would be lower quality soccer. Over time, the zones, to their credit, have recognized that players aren't getting the experience that they want from those environments. And there are players out there that demand more. So we've created environments that are meant to be a little bit higher quality at the zone level. And what we've seen over time is more and more players moving into those environments at earlier ages because of the perception of quality. And fewer players may be signing up for those community association programs that are lower cost and lower quality. So that, uh, that concept of not all programming being uh, impacted equally and quality mattering and meaning something in today's market is an important one to consider. So we'll shift gears a little bit. We've talked a lot about quality soccer. The other kind of piece to our pyramid or piece to our puzzle here is what about accessibility, inclusion, and welcoming environments? And I think we'll try this again in a, in a group setting, but I've, if possible, I'm gonna ask Hugh and Kevin to uh, bite their tongues a little bit to start off and see if we might be able to get a few other thoughts from some others on the call, because I know there's a lot of opinions out there. I know there's a lot of smart people and I'm gonna challenge all of you smart people in a few minutes uh, to be able to uh, uh, share some of that intelligence with all of us. Uh, but in the short term, let's have a little bit of a conversation, about 10 minutes or so, about the types of things that you would consider in fostering accessible and inclusive environments. So what does that mean to you? And again, I think, Raheem, they should still be able to all open up their own microphones? Yes. Perfect. Anyone want to take a stab at it? What's... Uh, What's, what's an accessible, inclusive, and welcoming environment? What does that mean to you? Ooh, quiet, don't all jump in at once. Yeah, this is because I'd probably say uh, watching the cost of our programming and also uh, making sure that uh, uh, we get in front of as many people as possible when we're promoting the program. Absolutely. Thanks, Rod. Two really good ones. Cost, that's one that jumps out right away, is we need to make sure that people can afford to participate if we want to be accessible and inclusive. And then the scope or the reach, so people need to know about it. There needs to be an awareness before we can get, uh, get that, uh, that engagement or that registration. If people don't know how to register, where to register, when to register, then we're not going to be a very inclusive environment. So that's a great one. What else? Rod was brave and started us off. What, uh, what else makes for an, an accessible and inclusive environment? Dave, I'd say uh, cultural awareness. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a, that's a huge one. And that has a lot to do with uh, what we had talked about before in the idea of feeling a sense of belonging or a sense of welcomingness. If you're, uh, for example, not able to participate in sport on, you know, a Friday or a Saturday or a Sunday because of religious ceremony, and that's when your team has their games or their practices, automatically you're going to be excluded from that environment. Or alternatively, if there are cultural practices that are important to you that, uh, that aren't recognized, supported, and appreciated within your environment, 
you're unlikely to want to come back to that environment because it's not safe, whether it be the language that's being used or the types of games that are being played or the type of approach that's being played. And that's a really hard one because there's so many different cultures and understanding cultural awareness is a really tricky one. It can be something as, uh, as complex as the ability in some cultures for uh, girls to play alongside boys or the day that these types of things happen or the environments in which they happen. So all of these things are in part uh, are an important piece of it, but certainly the idea of cultural awareness is, is key to that uh, uh, accessible and inclusive environment. Absolutely, Dan. Any other thoughts? Think about how we uh, kind of defined it as I was going through the sport for life ideas. The idea of the accessible piece being the removal of barriers and the inclusion piece being, you know, the creation of a sense of belonging or a feeling of being valued. What other barriers might exist that would prevent us from, uh, from playing soccer? So we've talked about financial. What about location? If I live, you know, in the south end as I do, and I don't drive, and the only soccer available to me is in the north end, that may be a barrier in terms of location and transportation, both of those things potentially being barriers to my ability to participate. Any other ideas along that? What else keeps especially kids, from being able to play the game. I know I've ran across it quite a few times over the last few years. It's just the type of household that kids have. It's a single parent, or they may not have any parents. They're just they're, uh, fostering. Um, and those families just aren't, aren't as flexible as maybe dual parent family. Yeah, absolutely. The, the home support or the home system, those that have a great support network at home probably can make it work regardless of when soccer is happening, where soccer is happening, how soccer is happening. Those without that flexibility at home or without that sport, without that support, certainly have a lot more challenging time being able to get to training sessions, being able to participate uh, at the level that they'd like to. And that's a, kind of another piece there where you talk about barriers to participation. If we set the, the expectation of our players that you're at every session, otherwise you can't play in games, and we have certain home environments that don't allow that, because I'm sure most of the time, especially with young kids, if you ask them, would you like to play soccer today? Most of them would say, yeah, I'd love to. They're not generally the ones that are saying, you know, mom, dad, please don't drive me to, to training tonight. Usually it's the other way around. It's that they can't get there. They're not able to. They don't have this home support. And some of them are maybe not comfortable reaching out and being able to ask for that help, even if it might be available through the club, through another parent or a friend or a coach. So that idea of the home environment having a big impact on the ability to, uh, uh, to participate. We talked a little bit about it, but I think uh, as an extension to, to the idea of the, the timing of the environment. So if all of our games take place at 445 and mom and or dad work till five o'clock and kids go to after school care programs, are they going to realistically be able to participate in a program that starts at that time? You know, probably not. So that's another barrier to their participation. So. All of these kind of structural pieces that may not allow them to be physically present in the location at the time that soccer is being delivered can be barriers to participation. What about from an inclusivity perspective? Any other thoughts in that space? That idea of, of the creation of feeling welcome and feeling, feeling valued. Uh, we had mentioned cultural awareness. So there's some elements of that certainly that would make this more or less uh, less of a priority. You know, there's, uh, there's groups like athletes with a disability, for example. Are we offering specialized program that might appeal to those individuals or is our expe expectation that they would participate alongside able-bodied programs or able-bodied athletes because that's the only program that's available? 
are we creating safe environments for LGBTQ uh, I2S uh, individuals? Are we creating environments where they feel safe and they feel welcome so that we can all play the game together? Are we creating environments that encourage newcomers or new Canadians to be able to play the game when there may be barriers in terms of the ability to speak the language, to understand how to sign up, to be able to have access to the technology if all of our registrations are online? So are we considering some of these ideas and some of these uh, concepts as we create our programming so that we can try to create an accessible or inclusive environment? And what does that mean to us? Any other thoughts in that area? Any other things that, uh, that you as a club might consider when you're starting to develop programs? Dave, um, I'll pop into this one again. So this is a little bit unique, but more, more I'm seeing every day. <coughs> Religious um, callbacks now. We get in uh, people now coming in into, into my club that um, can't play on Sundays, for instance, right? can't train on Sundays because it's, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a religious day, right? So we're having this, we see more and more of that actually. And we're having to really look at that carefully now to bring the inclusion into those, those players so that they can play, right? <clears throat> so that's, yeah, that's one that we see him coming in. That's a great point, Hugh. And, and generally speaking, obviously it's not, not universal, but most uh, days of ceremony in most religions are Fridays, Saturdays, or Sundays. And generally speaking, when do we hold our tournaments? Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. So, and that oftentimes is seen as a key piece uh, of bonding within our team, uh, the area where, you know, we really come together as a group because we're, you know, playing a number of games one after another. We have a chance to get to know each other. Maybe we're staying in a hotel or we're doing some of these things that involve uh, getting together outside of soccer. And some people may not be able to participate because the timing of those environments. And generally speaking, when, uh, when we re play in a tournament and things go really well, What's Sunday? It's our semifinal and final day. And all of a sudden, some individuals who are key components to the team or just want to be a part of that environment aren't able to play in those games because they're not able to play on the days that they occur. And that's uh, kind of a universal thing. It's not that, you know, some tournaments we might have a final on a Tuesday and others it might be Sunday, so you might have to miss those. Generally speaking, tournaments are played on a weekend and finals are played on a Sunday, unless it's a long weekend tournament, but uh, we won't make this too complex. But certainly something to consider. Are there uh, individuals who are being unfairly impacted by their religious beliefs and do our programs consider that? Because that potentially could be a reason why someone may not sign up for soccer or may not play at a certain level because there's tournaments and tournaments happen at a time when they have ceremonies. So uh, a great point there. Hey Dave, <clears throat> it's uh, Jerson speaking. Hi Jerson. Not sure if you can hear me. Yeah, but... I got you. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, has there been discussion in terms of sport clubs happening and let's say, for example, a, a club or a sport club that has soccer, um, maybe futsal, basketball and squash uh, popping up and, and creating a, a platform where kids can, again, multi-sport play in different teams within that same club and Obviously, from a periodization point, um, it, it would help the facilitation of better scheduling and, and better um, planning for the kid. But I'm curious, how, does, how, do, how do they fit into the club licensing if you're providing more than just soccer? Yeah, and I think uh, well, I'll start from it with your first question. Uh, I know there's been a number of people who have asked a similar type of question, uh, particularly those that come from European backgrounds or Central American backgrounds, uh, such as yourself, who, who grew up in those kind of environments where you were part of a sport club. So for those that, that may not know this, uh, Real Madrid, for example, is a sport club. 
they provide a number of different sports. They have volleyball, they have basketball, they have obviously a soccer team, uh, and they're a part of the community as well as being a very high achieving uh, uh, soccer team. If we look in, in uh, the Mexican League, uh, Chivas is a very famous sport club, and I've had the chance to spend a bit of time uh, in their facilities, and it, it's incredible. I'm not sure if you've uh, if you've been there uh, as well, Jerson, but some of the, uh, you know, they've got a pool and water slides and squash courts and tennis, and by the way, the soccer game's going on over here, and the kids are training over there the basketball team is on tonight and everyone spends a lot of time there so it's a very uh, kind of inclusive and uh, community-based environment. We don't see a lot of that in Canada. There are some ethnic-based clubs, particularly in uh, Ontario and a little bit in Alberta that operate that way, um, but I haven't seen many of them operating kind of on a higher uh higher level from a soccer perspective. In terms of club licensing, I think it would fit in the same way as, as a traditional soccer club would. They're still governed, they're still administered, they still provide programming, they just provide other things as well. So, uh, so I could see that being a, a something that could fit into that environment and maybe is a consideration for uh, accessibility and inclusion. So your uh, whoever gets Jerson in their group is going to have a good conversation with this next activity here because he's uh, a little bit ahead of me. So uh, so great question and, and a good thought for consideration. So now that we've talked a little bit about uh, about some of the considerations within uh, within the idea of accessibility and inclusion, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, and I apologize for those that uh, were on the call last time around because uh, it's a little bit of a, of a repetition. But for those that weren't a part of the last one, I wanted to revisit this just uh, quickly to make sure that we've got an understanding why this conversation around balance is important. So uh, this again comes from systems theory or systems thinking, and it's introducing this idea of a paradox or a, of a, or a polarity, which is this concept that two things are mutually exclusive and can't possibly exist at the, at the same time. And it's great some of the conversation we've had because you framed out what I was gonna present here really well. So. If you think of a typical soccer club, usually when we're starting out in our community, we create an environment where we serve the kids in our community. So we want everybody to be able to play soccer. So, you know, we offer a, a program that's very accessible and inclusive because we need to get started. We need numbers to be able to form teams. We need to be, as was mentioned uh, earlier on, we need to be in front of as many people as we can get to so that they know that this is a new program and we want to encourage them all to come out. So we run this really high uh, accessibility and include or accessible and inclusive program that targets as many people within our community as we possibly can. But generally speaking, because we're just uh, starting out, if we use some of the definitions that we talked about earlier on with quality sport, it's it's probably not the highest quality. We probably don't have great coaches because we're just starting and we haven't gone through that training process. We probably don't have a strong understanding of what developmentally appropriate is because we're just starting out. But we've got people playing the game. And with that means that we've probably got low quality, but also low cost, because we don't have some of those things. Over time, what tends to happen is some people within that environment start to want a little bit more. Maybe they want coaches that have a little bit better background in the game, or they at least want their coaches to have gone through some training, gone through, uh, uh, you know, had background checks, done some of these things that, uh, that can equip them to be able to better work with the young players that they're responsible for. Because as we had, uh, had mentioned earlier on, the coaches are like the, the cooks in the kitchen. They're the ones that are serving up the great food. And if they are serving up better food, then the customers are going to be happier. So what we do is say, okay, we need to have a little bit more quality. And what that does is drive up cost. And then over time, as uh, Rod had mentioned in our first piece about barriers of participation, we drive up cost to the point that people can no longer afford it. And then we lose that idea of accessibility and inclusion. And our reaction is to say, well, the things that are costing us more money are our fancy uniforms and our nice fields and our nice equipment and our quality coaches. So in order for us to be more accessible and inclusive again, we've got to strip those things out. So we head back this other way and we say, well, we're going to be a community club and we're going to strip out the quality from our programming so that we can make sure that people can be a part of it. And what we end up with is this infinity curve where we bounce back and forth thinking that we need to have one or the other. We can't possibly have both. But by asking the question a little bit differently, 
maybe we can get a different answer. So tonight's million dollar question, and you know, it only took me 50 minutes to get there, is how can we develop high quality programs that are also accessible and inclusive? And that's gonna be the challenge for all of us. And what I hope we can walk away and knowing some of the people that, uh, that have already spoken up and some of the others that have been a little bit quieter but I've seen uh, are on the call. Uh, I know there's smart people here and I know there's some people that are gonna come up with some really good solutions and we've heard one already. Um, so I'm gonna challenge you, Jerson, to uh, not revisit the sport club idea because we've chatted about that one already when we get to our activity. But, I've had the chance through the club licensing program to have these kinds of conversations across the country, to meet with clubs, to talk about how they're reducing barriers to participation, how they're making sure their programming is accessible and inclusive. And a lot of them have come up with some really good solutions. So some of the common ones that we see, and I know a lot of you are doing this already because I know some of the clubs in, uh, in Saskatchewan relatively well, but a lot of clubs have things like financial support or forgiveness programs. So they have money set aside to be able to help players to be able to play the game who can't afford it. Wonderful initiative, something that I think every club should be able to do, um, but that's something that's fairly commonplace across the country. The other thing we do is have partnerships. We've got incredible organizations that do great work like Kids Sport and Jumpstart that exist to help kids play sport. So a lot of organizations, and I would say most, try to access as many of those funds as they possibly can to be able to help people out so that they can play the game. We also see organizations look for donations or sponsorships or create scholarships, those types of things. So those could be individual donations or sponsorships where uh, you know, a family may sponsor other children to be able to play the game. You might be lucky enough to secure a corporate sponsor who is going to put money towards your club so that we can offset some costs. And I know for those of you that work in the, uh, the marketing area, uh, those things are hard to come by and they're gold when you do get them. But uh, the easy answer that we get on a lot of these calls is, oh, we'll just get a sponsorship. Well, if it were that easy, we'd all have all kinds of sponsorships and we wouldn't be having this conversation. Um, but it's certainly an option. And there are some organizations out there that have had some good success there. The other one that we see often is the idea of VIK, which is value in kind. So it's the idea of being able to give something in order to receive something. So a lot of organizations will be able to create environments like that around things like equipment, maybe, or uniforms, or, uh, you know, if you give us a service, we'll post your information on our website or we'll share your corporate information with our membership. So that idea of providing some value in exchange for uh, some type of service that can offset some costs. We also have a lot of organizations that have come up with really creative volunteer opportunities. So uh, if your team comes and volunteers at our tournament, because we always need people and it's always a challenge to have uh, runners and marshals and all of these people that make tournaments go, we'll pay you and you can use that money to offset your fees. Some organizations now have taken that to the next level where they're saying everyone pays a volunteer fee and if you don't, uh, if you don't volunteer, then you'll just forfeit that money. And obviously that's again a challenge in terms of maintaining that accessibility and inclusion because if you can't afford the fees in the first place, you certainly aren't also going to be able to afford the volunteer uh, fees. So that idea of, of paid volunteer opportunities can also have uh, an impact on some families more than others. There's organizations out there, I know this used to be a big one when I was little and uh, I know my parents were so thankful when I turned 16 and was allowed to do them myself, uh, but going into the smoky old bingo and selling cards and doing all the things that uh, we needed to do to be able to, uh, to raise funds in the good old days. I know there's still some clubs that have the benefit of bingos. They've, uh, they're not as, as prevalent as they used to be. Uh, there's some organizations that are lucky to have casino funding. Uh, this is a big one in Alberta where, uh, where different sport clubs can apply for the opportunity to come in and provide support to casinos on certain nights and take home a share of the revenues. So that's a great opportunity to be able to bring in money. And then the, the fundraising one. So bottle drives, selling chocolate bars, selling raffle tickets, all of these things that we do to be able to offset fees. So these are all great initiatives. And they're all things that organizations have been uh, creative, creative in creating in order to try to balance that idea of having high quality with accessibility and inclusion. So they're all meant to support people who may not have the financial means to be able to participate or globally to reduce the cost for all participants so that more people can access. 
So back to our million dollar question, how can we develop high quality programs that are accessible and inclusive? And I'm gonna go back to this screen for a second here because these ones are too easy. I know all of you are very bright. I know all of you have got a lot of great ideas. I've heard one already on this call before even getting to this activity. So we're gonna take these ones off the table. So I want us to break into groups and we're gonna give you, uh, I think because the groups are gonna be a little bit bigger, we'll probably give you about 15 minutes within your group. We're gonna have a small group discussion about what types of things we can do to develop high quality programs that are also accessible and inclusive. And what we'll do after that 15 minutes is we'll bring everybody back in and we'll have each group select someone to, pre to present on your behalf. Uh, and what you're going to give us is your gold. So you're gonna give us the one thing that you're going to take back to your club from that discussion and think about implementing. And then what's your runner up? What's the other thing, the, the other idea that you might want to explore a little bit further? Uh, and if we break up into, uh, Raheem, what were we thinking? Probably four to five uh, groups? There'll be four groups of four. Four groups of four, perfect. So four groups of four. So when everybody comes back, that'll give us four nuggets of gold, one from each group, and four other things that we'll want to explore. Expecting that we may have a little bit of overlap, that'll give us somewhere between you know, four to eight ideas that we might be able to explore in our club to be able to create high quality programs that are also accessible and inclusive. So I'm gonna turn it over to Raheem because he's gonna break us off into our breakout groups and I'll uh, kind of pop into a few of the groups over the course of the next 15 minutes or so uh, just to listen in and, and ask some questions and poke a little bit uh, if, uh, if need be. But I want all of you just to think about this and as you come together in your group before, have a really good conversation and think outside the box a little bit. What can you do as a club to make sure that you're having quality programs because we know that's important to our participants, but that people can access and will feel included. So any questions before we break out uh, into our rooms? I know Raheem, you had said oftentimes in rooms, uh, if you're worried about forgetting what these four uh, uh, ones that are off the table are, uh, you might wanna take a picture of this. So I'll leave that up for a second. Uh, any other uh, breakout room instructions that, uh, that you can share from your experience, Raheem? Uh, it always helps to put your cameras on. So if you are Zoom ready, then uh, it's nice to always see a face to the instead of a black screen. So um, you'll get a a bunch of people actually just dropped off. So we're gonna have three rooms. Um, okay. So you'll all <laughs> nobody get wanted to, nobody wanted to do the activity. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're opening all the rooms right now. Okay. Perfect. And I'm not gonna take offense to that. I'm gonna say people had things to go to at night uh, nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Perfect. So I think we've got everybody back. So I, uh, I dropped in quickly on each of the uh, the rooms there and some really good conversation going on. So I'm very curious to see uh, kind of what that piece of gold is that, uh, that you talked about as a group, the one that came out of it that uh, you'd like to talk a little bit more or take back with you to your club. Uh, and hopefully there'll be some that the other groups came up uh, with as well that will help there. And then was there another idea that maybe you didn't get quite as much time to hash out, but it was something that, uh, that you think might be worth exploring a little bit further. So uh, we'll go in, uh, in the order of, uh, I think the rooms maybe that I dropped into if, if that works. So uh, we'll start with the group that had uh, Jerson and, uh, and Kevin. So I'm not sure if you decided who your spokesperson was gonna be or if you're all gonna start talking at once, but- uh, it's, not the guy from, it's not the guy from Chelsea. So <laughs> Jerson's gonna speak on our- I guess our, I would- I'm the youngest, so I got nominated. So, uh, and if I miss anything, feel free to also join, guys. Um, I guess they, we really had two that we felt were kind of on the same level. Um, one big one that, that we kind of talked a bit um, was providing a bit more variety in the, the format of more so for indoor season. It, we feel sometimes it, it's too long and and then the cost also might be a detriment to, to, to kids to sign up for the length of it. So having, I think we, we spoke about maybe like two month blocks of formats of maybe it's 77, maybe it's futsal, maybe it's Lemby 11. Um, and then the kids can actually sign up for what they're interested in and keeps costs low. 
And then the other idea that we kind of spoke about was creating partnerships with actually schools, be it elementaries or high schools, for various reasons. One is accessibility to facilities is, is a big detriment and, and it's tough to do. It takes care of the kind of the three to five hour window where like you need parents to leave work to pick up the kids. But also from a safety standpoint, like schools have an action emergency action plan. They have everything readily available. And then one thing that we do at the university level is we still train during final exams because it actually helps our players retain more information. Um, so incorporating maybe training at a different time than the three to five, could you train from 10 to 12 or 1130? And, and that also helps academically the kids be able to be fresh and retain information and just kind of flip the script a little bit in terms of almost doing two things at once. I would say if I miss anything, guys, feel free to add. Oh, spot on, spot on. That's great. And, and there are some, uh, some environments, those that are familiar. I know, Kevin, you spent a bit of time uh, with the impact. Uh, the Sporty 2 program in, uh, in Quebec is set up in that way, where they have uh, specific schools in each region of the, uh, uh, of the province that cater to athletes, basically. And they, right. they do exactly like that. And they do their training during the day. Uh, they're done. Uh, their school uh, day goes a little bit longer. So the other benefit to that for those uh, uh, like me that have young kids is you fill that uh, that after school program time where, uh, you know, school ends at 3 or 3.30, work ends at 4.30 or 5. And you've got a block of time in there where uh, you need to find something to do with your kids. So it, it kind of extends that day by adding their sports right into it. And then they have their evenings free to go and do homework and all of these other things. So uh, it's great. A couple of good, uh, good suggestions and the idea of of variety so different formats uh, for different time frames and potentially that uh, that may impact accessibility and inclusion from a facility standpoint as well obviously if you're playing futsal it would require different facilities than if you were playing 11 aside soccer or seven aside soccer so potentially it means that you know a game that had always occurred in one center or two centers in the city uh, can now occur in multiple environments at certain times a year which might make it easier that's uh, uh, off to a good start so group two, which was uh, Mike and uh, uh, his team that, uh, that we dropped in on uh, as the second one. Okay, perfect. Um, so we, we talked about a lot of ideas. There were a couple ones that really stood out to us and, and one of the ones that really came back to, it's not such a specific thing, but it's more of a consistent thing. So it's, making sure that whatever your club does, it, it's united in how it does it. And there's consistency in your club from top to bottom, because if not, the principles aren't going to be relayed to all the participants. So how inclusive and how accessible are your programs actually? And, and one of the pieces that um, um, Paul Thompson brought up was something that the Whitecaps have started to do in terms of trying to promote and relay their messages in um, as many languages as they can for their participants to ensure that there is as few barriers as possible to communication and to this messaging. So not only ensuring your messaging from top to bottom is consistent, but ensuring that it's delivered as fairly as possible to, to reach as wide of a base as possible. And then the other one that, that came up was um the travel piece right and how, how do we tackle the barrier to travel and, and the barrier to actually getting to the facility so um consistency again was a big one if you can have a consistent place that you're going to it's easier for planning around that that's for sure and, and then one of the ideas that really emerged was can you become more of a club in the sense that you're not just there it's not just your field but in the ideal world, you have something that people can come before and they can enjoy the experience and they can stay and they enjoy the experience. So what that would do is even if you had people maybe living on the same block that didn't play on the same team or train at the same time, well, they're at the same location and there's something that's enticing and keeping people there for longer. So it just 
increases the number of opportunities to, to find supports and to find rides. And I guess you as a club should have some kind of programs or some kind of response or set up in terms of trying to develop that support system to get kids to and from the location. Excellent. Some, uh, some good ones there. The, uh, the idea of language is, is such an important one today with, uh, with so many new Canadians. There's a club that, uh, that I've been working with uh, in Vancouver that is uh, really heavily focused on servicing the, uh, the Indo-Canadian community. And what they found was the Respect in Sport parent program, as an example. Uh, the parents were really challenged because a lot of them were first generation Canadians and didn't have great English skills. So they were really challenged with, uh, with taking on the Respect in Sport parent program, even though they felt as a club, this was a really important uh, kind of additional service that we could provide to create the right environment that we want for our players. So they've actually worked with Respect Group uh, to create uh, an extension of the program or a translation of the program in a number of different languages so that their communities uh, and their parents are better able to understand it. So sometimes because most of the, the players in the environment uh, speak English or French, if, if that's your language uh, of operation, uh, we sometimes take for granted that the household speaks those languages, and that may not be the case. And, and oftentimes, it's the parents who are responsible for, you know, receiving coach communications, receiving club communications, uh, registering, uh, understanding the schedule. And if English isn't their first language, or they have limited English skills, uh, it can be a challenge for them to be able to understand what the expectations are, you know, where you need to be and when, and uh, uh, that that idea of being able to communicate in, in appropriate languages or advertise in appropriate languages is an important one uh, and becoming more important, uh, particularly in, uh, in Saskatchewan as, as compared to it was to what it was even five or 10 years ago. Uh, so that's a great one. And again, kind of aligned to the idea that, uh, that Jerson brought up on the sport club side of things, that idea of, of the club being kind of a hub for the community. And, you know, you think about, uh, I think most of the people on the call uh, left on the call now uh, are from from one of the two major centers but you look at you know the indoor facilities in Saskatoon and Regina and you know there are players and, and families that congregate there for extended periods of time and it becomes their their home and I know uh, um, I think Hugh Dooley is still there the uh, the new setup at uh, Queen City where that was a consideration about having a players lounge where uh, you know if you are there families are there multiple players you can come and spend the night even if you aren't training uh, right away and it does take some of those uh, those challenges challenges or can take some of those challenges around travel so uh, excellent a couple of, uh, of really good suggestions there and uh, certainly not least but uh, the last group that uh, that I dropped in on and I think that was uh, Jordan and Hugh I think that was your group that was the last one Rochelle you want to talk or is it me I'll let you Hugh okay so uh, our discussion focused a bit more on the the idea of what you talked about, the cost issues, Dave, about, um, you know, how do you control costs but still deliver programming? And, and, what, and what other ways are there to uh, generate funding outside of the parents or the players themselves? So we talked a bit about a, a supporters program. Um, to try to uh, get funds from the grandparents and the aunts and the uncles who, who you usually wouldn't get money from um, to try to, you know, they would get a package from the organization and, and they become a supporter. So all of a sudden that brings in another revenue stream. Uh, and then we talked a bit uh, about using lottery to your advantage, um, especially in Saskatchewan where, you know, every raffle you do gets you another 25%. Um, so trying to use that as a, as another means to generate revenue that you, that you may not normally get, you know, finding creative ways to do that. Um, and that, you know, for us, it can be taking off the fees, whatever the case might be, but it's just generating revenue in other ways. So, so I think that was a, some of our discussion. Um, you know, we, they talked about, you know, the cooperation between the zones, um, especially in Saskatoon. In delivering quality programming, um, I think one of the things I raised for for me is we all don't have to be everything to everyone. And I think sometimes when we get talking about 
inclusion and you know accessibility is completely different um, in the sense that if somebody wants to get in your program you have the means and ways for them to do that but I think with inclusion we sometimes think that we have to do everything for everyone and sometimes somebody else does something better than you so let them do it so um, you know in Regina there's a very healthy recreational level side of soccer so I would I would argue that they are doing a good job for the clientele that they have the only piece that they probably miss is they don't push people or provide information of the fact that there's club soccer in Regina right they, they tend to want to hold on to people because they see that as revenue for their programs but otherwise I think they do a good job of their programs so if, how do you get that cooperation maybe to, to change in both scenarios um, so that you can help them deliver a bit of a better program maybe if they have some weaknesses and then they they can help you as well yeah to go back to that uh, that statement from the the sport for life crew around collaboration so uh, it is hard especially uh, you know it, it's it's less of a challenge in some areas of the country that have clubs that are you know four thousand to ten thousand people maybe in those kind of environments you can be everything to everyone uh, with smaller clubs and finite resources, that's a challenge. So I think being value or mission clear or, or vision clear on who you are and who you want to be uh, can be a powerful thing. And that way you do attract the clientele that are looking for a specific service, but you also then allow those that don't want that service or aren't looking for that service to be able to pursue that. Obviously for those that, uh, that live in Saskatoon, uh, there, there's some challenges with that in a zoned environment where uh, in essence, you're obligated to provide basically all programming to everyone in that area of the city. But even within that constraint, you can still be clear in terms of what you stand for as a club and be willing to support uh, people moving into other environments that may not be looking for what you're able to provide. So that idea of, of vision and mission clarity is, is a good one. And I think as well, uh, again, to, to kind of go back to the, the previous slide around uh, those creative strategies to reduce um, to reduce some of the financial barriers and understanding your local environment. So uh, even, you know, living here now for uh, coming up on 12 years, I didn't realize the, the extra bonus you have of using lotteries. So there's probably a lot of organizations out there that, uh, that may do something like that or be interested in something like that, but may not even understand that that's an option. So uh, exploring those opportunities that, uh, that can add value to your club within your own environment. So, um, I didn't count them up, but uh, but I think there are some uh, some pieces of gold there. I think there are some things there that uh, certainly, as individuals representing clubs, uh, you may want to take back and uh, and have some conversation about. And I think for me, that's really what this was about was kind of introducing the concept of it not having to be an either or, uh, not having to say, look, we need lower cost, which means we can't have standards, we can't have high quality coaching, we can't have good equipment and nice facilities because we've got to keep the cost low. Yes, we do want to be able to uh, mitigate the challenges that come with rising costs, but there's a demand for quality as well. And I don't think we can sacrifice or strip out the quality uh, in order to make sure that we, uh, that we reduce those costs. So can we be creative? And just in that 15 minute activity with four of you, uh, there was some great creativity and there were some great solutions. And I would encourage all of you uh, to kind of continue that conversation, to take that back to your clubs where you're the leaders and have a, a more detailed, a more lengthy conversation about how you might be able to have both, the best of both worlds. Can we have a high quality program that's also accessible and inclusive instead of it being one or the other. If we're going to provide an accessible program, then we can't have quality. Or if we're going to have a quality program, then we need to sacrifice accessibility. So uh, I appreciate the, the thoughts there. I'll add one uh, kind of on my uh, of my own, uh, in addition to the ones that I gave you uh, earlier on, just to kind of wrap things up and bring them to the close in the interest of, uh, of making sure. So we're playing 90 minutes plus time added. So we're in time added right now. Uh, so the one that I saw that uh, I, I steal from martial arts, and, uh, and I'll credit uh, Jason DeVos for passing this information along to me, uh, his son is in Taekwondo. And uh, they, they, the way they organize themselves is very fluid in terms of uh, the requirements of time. So essentially, they sign up for the number of sessions that they want uh, in a week. 
and there are sessions going on every day. So one of the barriers that can come up in our environments is if, uh, and I'll use this as an example because it's the time that I coached uh, most recently, uh, anyway, if under 11 Division II soccer is on Monday at 5.15 every week and my son or daughter is a Division II under 11 player, but I'm not available at 5.15 on a Monday, then it means that I can't play in that environment. And when we have an environment that has specific tiers of play uh, aligned to specific times as the only availability, that can have an impact on my ability to be able to participate. So, you know, potentially I could take my son or daughter and say, okay, well, Wednesday or Thursday works better for me, so I'm going to play Division Three soccer. But is that going to be the right environment when we go back to being developmentally appropriate for, uh, for my son or daughter to have a great experience and want to come back the next day? So that idea that they do with Taekwondo is if I can come Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, great. If I want to come Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, that's great too. If I'm a weekend warrior and I want to do Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that works. If I have ceremony on those days, so I'm only going to be available during the week, that's fine too but they find ways to be able to get people through the door so that they can participate rather than through the structure, creating environments where I can't find my appropriate program because of the day of the week and the time that it's offered or the location. So one more little piece, I don't know if it's gold or not. Maybe we'll call that one bronze. We'll call what you guys brought to the table the gold. Um, so with that, uh, I just want to, uh, to thank you again for making the time. Uh, I hope that it was valuable. Uh, I hope that it gave you an idea of the types of things to consider when we talk about quality sport, the types of things to consider when we talk about accessibility and inclusion, and then the idea of phrasing our question a little bit differently so that we can get a better answer. So how can we have high quality programs, which is what our customers want, that are also accessible and inclusive, which is foundational to the principles of what we want to deliver as a soccer community. So appreciate all of your contributions, appreciate all of your time. Uh, we didn't get to the, uh, the risk, uh, treating, treating as risk. I'll include those slides still if you wanna have a look at them. And certainly if as individuals, uh, you wanna have a conversation about, uh, about that area, I'm more than happy to. Or if uh, through Raheem, you wanted to coordinate an opportunity to be able to have a little bit more formal get together like this, uh, to go through some of those things, I'm more than happy to. Um, but I know I took a lot from this. I hope you did too. And I hope that there's some takeaways there that you can use within your own environments to be able to create programs that are both high quality and accessible and inclusive. So uh, thank you for your time. Thanks for all your contributions. Uh, stay safe, everyone. I know we're, we're on the right track here in Saskatchewan. So I'm really hoping I'm going to be able to see all of you uh, on the field again very soon. So uh, take good care, stay safe, and we'll uh, chat again soon. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you, Dave. Dave. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Okay, thanks, Raheem. Thanks, guys. Take care, Hugh.